Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches has some great tropical plants for your garden. At the Wes Watkins Research and Extension Center in Lane, Oklahoma, we look at using row covers to protect watermelons from curious feathered friends. We see how OSU researchers combine high-tech and low-tech to make turf grasses more beautiful, resilient, and safer for athletic fields. And Barbara Brown has advice for buying a used pressure canner. In a time when we're all looking for a little bit of an escape, but yet traveling can be difficult, staycations have become quite popular. Now typically that means being a tourist in your local area. There's no reason that you can't convert your backyard into a tropical paradise with the addition of a few plants that have bold foliage and bright colors. To give us a dramatic backdrop, calicaceas, also known as elephant ears or taros, come in a wide array of patterns, colors, and sizes. Anywhere from lime green to more of almost a black color, they can range in height from one and a half foot all the way up to nine feet tall. Now, calicaceas do prefer full sun and moist soil, and in fact do well even as a bog plant in water gardens. They're hardy from zones eight to 10, which means they're most likely gonna be tropical, but we have on occasion had them over winter here in Oklahoma. In Hawaii, you'll often see this taro grown as an agriculture product because the root is used to make poi. Now this particular one I'm standing in front of here is called mojito and is prized for its speckled pattern. We also have another one here called coffee cups that the leaf actually folds up, creating a cup-like effect. While there are several calicaceas on the market, each offering their own unique style, if you really want something that's going to grab people's attention, you want to get Thai Giant. It's one of the largest calicaceas that are on the market, and you can see just one leaf will provide plenty of shade. While cannas is an obvious choice to add to a tropical backyard paradise, another plant you might want to think about is called Cestrum. This is a uh, evergreen perennial in zones eight and south. However, here in Oklahoma, it will be marginally hardy, but often will die back to the ground and still recover. You can see it grows quite a lot in one season, getting up to about six feet tall. Now this particular cultivar I'm standing by is called Orange Zest, which offers this nice kind of a pale orange flower. And it is fragrant, but you'll notice the fragrance that really starts to express itself more in the evening hours than in the daytime. However, with that tubular flower, you're gonna find plenty of pollinators throughout the day on it, including hummingbirds and butterflies. Passion vine is another plant that'll give you that great tropical look with its alien, almost tropical-like flowers. With over 400 different species in this genre, there are many different passion vines to choose from. However, this one is incense, which is actually hardy and will overwinter here and gives you this lovely dark purple uh, flower to it. As the name implies, it is a, a vine that will tend to climb. And once it's established, it may even start to sucker for you. In addition to the flowers, you'll also get those lovely passion fruits off of this plant. Now, don't be surprised or alarmed if you see any orange spiky looking caterpillars or maybe several hundred orange spiky caterpillars on this plant. It's actually one of the preferred host plants for the orange golf fritillary. Now, while many species of the passion vine are tropical, there are some that are hardy and there's even one Passiflora incarnata, which is native to Oklahoma that you might want to try. 
When you're designing your tropical paradise in your backyard, you can't forget to add some color to those containers. Now I know when we talk about designing a container, it can get a little overwhelming and seem complicated when we talk about spillers, thrillers, and fillers. So if you wanna look for a simple alternative, just buy a Tacoma and put it in the container. This plant, a one gallon, will grow quickly into a three to four foot tall shrub, which will be nice for a large container. Now this particular one is a cultivar called Bells of Fire that has more of an orangey, kind of a reddish flower. There's also one called Orange Jubilee. And then of course the one that we most often see is Yellow Bells. While some people call this plant Tacoma and some call it Yellow Bells, I actually learned this plant as Esperanza, which in Spanish means hope. Who says you have to go to the tropics in order to get bananas? In fact, we've had banana plants overwinter for us here in Stillwater. Now, when you're trying to get hardy bananas to overwinter, the first few years, you wanna make sure to layer some mulch on the roots as those roots are trying to get established. But as they continue to grow, they're going to get more cold hardy for you um, as they get a bigger root system. Now, this particular species is Musa volutina, which has a pink sort of, of a velvet bananas. Now, these are best uh, enjoyed by just looking at them rather than tasting them. Now there is a species that is actually even more cold hardy, Musu Baju, which is cold hardy all the way up to zone five. So if you're a little bit concerned about trying this one, you might try that one for a little bit more cold hardiness. Regardless of which species of banana you choose, whether it's hardy or tropical, you're gonna either get green or maroon foliage, giving you that nice tropical look. So you can see, even though you can't get away to your tropical location this year, there is still hope when you turn your backyard into your own tropical paradise. Here at Lane, Oklahoma, at the West Watkins Research and Extension Center, we have a, uh, a watermelon uh, variety demonstration planting here. Uh, the purpose of this is just to, uh, you know, as time goes on, new varieties uh, come out and be available for growers and home gardeners. So we just like to uh, uh, occasionally demonstrate some of those. Uh, occasional growers will come by asking, uh, you know, what varieties are, are good for the area. So, like I say, we'll get a little bit of, of, of local uh, of a local trialing experience by doing this. Uh, the, uh, as you can see, we have some really nice vines and we're starting to get some fruit developing. The fruit are not quite ripe yet uh, for us to harvest and, and, and put to use. However, we already have a problem with wildlife uh, causing damage to them. And that's, that is, uh, I'd say for both commercial growers and home gardeners, there's not, nothing more disheartening. You go to all the trouble to grow that crop and, and you get some, some nice fruit developing and then just uh, overnight some animal comes in there and takes a bite out of it and that pretty much it's going to be, be worthless. So uh, here what we have is we've had uh, uh, some crows that have, uh, you can see here, uh, some crows have eaten holes in the little water, in the watermelon there and they don't take much of it but that's enough to, to destroy the melon uh, so it won't be of any value. So. Uh, again, dealing with wildlife and crops like this is you can't, if you could spend all your time out here and chew them away, that'd be nice, but that's not practical. But there are some things that you can do. Uh, one thing that we've, we've uh, tried to do is, uh, or actually have done for several years, and it seems to work pretty good, is when we get areas in the field where we have, uh, have some melons uh, developing and, and, but not quite mature, we, uh, we use uh, different kind of horticulture materials that we have on hand, and we're pretty much just repurposing things that have been left from other projects. Here we're gonna use this netting material here. Uh, we have the two corners, uh, two corners uh, with a piece of rebar, we have it tied into the ground, and we're just gonna pull it over top here. Again, we have, oh, probably a half dozen nice melons here. Uh, we're gonna pull it over top and tie it off to this, to this piece of metal rebar. So that will keep, for the most part, uh, from our experience, that will keep 
the birds out. It'll keep uh, the coyotes from, uh, they just, they don't seem to want to go under, go to the trouble to crawl underneath there. So, uh, so that'll protect the melons from, from, uh, from any, from wildlife damage. Hi, my name is Charles Fontanier, Assistant Professor in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture, and I'm here at the brand new Obrey Stadium to talk a little bit about our turf management uh, four-year degree program, as well as some of the career options for our graduates. Our graduates are predominantly interested in managing sports fields and golf courses, and we have a number of graduates who are at top 50 national golf courses in, uh, all around the country and at uh, all levels of sports field including professional and collegiate levels. So chief among the interests of those who are interested in sports field management is getting a good quality internship at a place like Oklahoma State University's athletic fields and, and head groundsman uh, Todd Tribble does a great job taking care of the field but any turf manager whether they're at a professional stadium or even at a rec league uh, municipal athletic complex, they use their science-based training to manage turf both for aesthetics but also for performance and most importantly player safety. So to ensure a field is playing properly and is, is safe for play, there are a number of tools that a, a field manager can use. One of them is called the Clegg Impact Tester and essentially it's a hammer that is dropped down a, a tube of known length. The firmness of that surface is, is measured by how quickly that, that hammer stops. The NFL and other uh, leagues have developed certain standards for their players so that the fields meet a certain hardness and, and is safe for play. The other instrument that we're, we're showing you today is, uh, is, is used to measure what's called shear strength of the turf. And so it's a good indicator of how a field will, will tolerate a player making a sharp cut on the field, uh, what kind of stability it has, and it's measuring the torque required to, to tear that surface just like a cleat might. And so certain management practices can be uh, altered to either improve or decrease surface hardness or to the same extent improve shear strength so that we can have certain playability characteristics athlete injuries are not only associated with poor playing conditions but very inconsistent playing conditions going from one area that's a little bit soft to another area that's a little bit hard and that's where a lot of those transition areas become uh, very prone for injury. We're here at the OSU Turfgrass Research Center to take a look at some of the active research we have going on at the station. OSU is a world-class uh, Bermuda grass breeding program and so what we have done over the last several decades is try to develop new and improved grasses for sports fields, golf courses, and home lawns. And these grasses have a number of, of improved traits or qualities that uh, professionals and homeowners appreciate. And today we're going to look at a, a specific project trying to improve the traffic tolerance of Bermuda grasses. So in the sports field world, Traffic is one of the major issues that plague managers. We have a research trial right behind me here. And in this trial, we have nine Bermuda grasses that are commonly sold in the market today. And uh, we're hoping to show how these different grasses respond to traffic, in particular football type traffic with simulated cleat traffic. In order to provide simulated traffic, we have this specialized machine that has metal plates that act like feet. And we have cleats that are embedded in, in the bottom of them. So as we operate the machine on the plots, it's going to put approximately 640 cleat marks per square meter, which is effectively uh, uh, one NFL game as played between the hash marks. And so we can do one pass, two pass, three pass, and have a certain number of simulated football games on these fields, 
and have an idea of how they might respond. Well, thank you for joining me today. Hopefully you got to learn a little bit about our undergraduate turf program, but also about the research and, and what goes into making the grasses that you may have in your, in your own lawn or at your, at your rec uh, uh, sports facility. I want to thank again my graduate student, Mr. Shebaz Singh, for, for demonstrating some of those research activities that we, we, uh, we do here at the university, and, and also Mr. Todd Tribble for allowing us to, to hang out in this uh, brand new stadium. If you have any questions about what kind of grass to plant in your yard or, uh, or maybe a, a park or rec field, you're welcome to contact uh, county extension personnel or even reach out to folks in our department at, uh, at hortla.okstate.edu. A lot of times people want to take up pressure canning or canning in general and one of the first things they realize is they're going to need some special equipment. So where do you go for special equipment? A garage sale because somebody out there wanted to do it, found out it wasn't for them or something else and so now all of these pieces of equipment are available to you at a little bit lower price which could be a good thing if you know what you're doing. So we're going to start, these are different kinds of pressure canners and kind of point out the pluses and the minuses and whether or not this is one that you might in fact want to pass rather than invest in if you're going to use it for home canning. So this first one is a fairly old model and uh, if you look at the at the lid here, you can see it, uh, who made it. It's national. Presta or it's national. Uh, many of the companies have merged over the years, so National and Presto are now the same company, but originally they each had their own canners, so uh, that's what you see there. Uh, I'm going to skip for just a moment about what else is uh, the, the lid would tell us and look at what's inside the canner, because if you're garage sailing, you'll often find them with surprises inside, uh, and this, in fact, does have it. Now, it's got a lot of what you might think is useful. Uh, there's some rings which could be useful, but once they're ru rusted, once they lose the luster, once they are dented, then they're no longer valuable. And if you look down in inner further, you'll find that these would not be a lid that would be useful for canning at all. In the in the past, many people have used these. My own mother has used these. I grew up using this kind of thing. But research has shown us uh, that it's not the best choice. You don't know if you've got a good seal. Uh, and so we don't use the, these anymore. The other issue with a canner this old is simply that you're, you're missing 40, 50, 60 years worth of, of research in home canning that you're not getting the benefit of because these canners were state of the art at one time, but they're not state of the art now. So that might be another reason to pass them by. So uh, that imp those things are all in here. Let's see what else we got. One of the things when you're looking at that, whether you're looking at an older canner or a newer canner, you want to make sure you have all the pieces and you really want to know that you can get the user manual. If you can't get the user manual, then you won't be able to replace the parts uh, unless you can find what model it is. Uh, so uh, there's that issue too. Uh, this one uh, could be used as a, as a steamer. Uh, or that could be also be a rack. And then there's a couple of different racks in here. However, both of them uh, are uh, rusty, and that's something that you would, again, want to replace. Uh, this one's not so much rust, but if you look in that one, you can see that it's definitely re uh, rusted and would need to be worked on. As you look at the rest of the canner, because you do need to have a rack of some kind, uh, look at the handles. Make sure that they're first that they're there because some of these older models you find that you're missing a handle uh, and that the handles are tight. This is the case with this one. I'm not sure you could loosen them, however, because the, the screws on there look, look uh, pretty well uh, done in. So let's look at the lid again. Now one of the things that a lot of us are familiar with, if you're familiar with canners, is, is you need a gasket. 
This particular model of canner is steel on steel or metal on metal. And so this lid fits in there without a gasket. So that's not something that you're going to have to replace. Uh, but notice that it does need to fit in well. So you need to check the canner to make sure that it's very flat on the bottom because if it's warped, it's not good for canning anymore on the bottom and that the lid fits on securely. This one actually, uh, if I can twist it at all to get them to line up, this one, if, if these were down far enough, uh, these would go into the latch there and then you would tighten them down on opposite sides. If that doesn't work anymore, if the, if the canner is out of shape in any way, then this is not a canner that you could use for pressure canning. It might be able to be used for other kinds of cooking. You might even be able to use it for a boiling water canner, uh, but it's not going to be able to be used for pressure canning. Other things you're going to look at, uh, what are the components? These are actually handles to help you lift the lid. The older canners are very thick metal and they're very heavy, uh, which is an issue for a lot of folks when they start to lose strength as they get older. They can't lift the canner, particularly when it's full of hot water, uh, and so they have to let it cool down on the stove and then scoop the water out to get it away. But these were originally designed to be uh, lifting out. This is one of the ways that you would close the canner down. Is that going to work anymore? Uh, can you get it replaced if you need to? Uh, there should be a weight here. Uh, then you look at the dial gauge. On a dial gauge canner, this is one of the first clues that you're going to have that this could be replaced if you knew the model. This canner is not identified by model. Sometimes you'll find that information underneath the handle. Uh, sometimes you'll find it on the bottom of the canner. You'll find it in the manual if you can find the manual, but this doesn't have any of those. So what you need to replace the appropriate parts on the appropriate canner. And if you can't find that information, then it, it, it's not going to work. You replace a dial gauge if it's cracked, if it's rusty, uh, if it's got water in it, those are all signs that you need to replace it. You also need to have it tested to make sure that it's accurate. And if this would, does not fit on the kinds of testers that we use, which it does not, then you have to be able to take this off, which you need to do to replace it anyway, uh, and just let the, the county educator test the dead dial gauge. So these are several signs that this is a great canner if you want something that, that looks good, uh, but it's not necessarily a good buy if you're actually going to use it for pressure canning. Let's see some of the other kinds, some of the newer models that you might run across also in garage sales. This, again, is, is a newer model. It's also a dial gauge, but are all the parts here. One of the nice things about newer ones is that they have safety features built in that we don't find here. Uh, one of the, the best ones uh, around, well, there are a couple. One of this is an overpressure plug, so that if the canner gets too hot, this blows out, and so that the canner doesn't blow up. We don't have that kind of a safety feature on that one, and that getting too hot is going to happen when it gets, uh, when the water uh, gets dry. Uh, it also has a lock so that I can't open this canner if it's under pressure. Uh, that lock system is right here. If you look at the canner, you notice there's a lip here. Uh, when the, there is no pressure in the canner, this is down, and it will slide underneath the, the little ledge there. When the pressure is up, this is pushed up, and then it can't get past that ledge. And so I can't open this canner until the pressure is completely down to zero. And that is good because if you open it too soon, then things start flying out of it, things start breaking. The other things you're going to look for, are, again, are the handles tight. This one's a little bit loose. Is it tightenable? Sometimes there's a screw hole on them that you can tighten. I know on the bottom one, there's a, a screw down here that I can tighten up. It uh, doesn't look like that's an option on the, on the ones on top. Uh, so you want to make sure that everything is secure. Uh, you want to make sure, again, that it's flat on the bottom, that there's a rack. This one has the manual that goes with it, so that's a definite plus. It also has uh, the weight that has to be on this canner. Now, if that weight is not there, I need to use the manual to replace it because I need to make sure that I have the right one. If I go to my pressure saucepan and grab one from there, or I go to an old canner and grab one from there, they may not be calibrated for this particular model. So I need to get the one that goes with this model. All the parts need to go together. This canner I'd need to take in, have a county educator uh, make sure that uh, the dial gauge is accurate. I'd also want to look at the gaskets. Here we have a gasket because we don't have the clamps that go down. This should be pliable. These are replaceable components and should be replaced every couple of years anyway after you own the canner. And when you replace that, you'd replace this at the same time because they're made of the same um, metals or, excuse me, um, chemicals. Uh, and if one's worn out, the other one will be too. 
Uh, so those are some things you look for with that. This one, uh, that one does have a rack on the bottom as well. Uh, you notice again that there's sometimes some things in there, sometimes not. This one is a weighted gauge canner, basically the same as this, except it doesn't have a dial on it. Uh, and when you're looking at this one, you again, look at those same kinds of things, but then you also look to make sure that the weight is present, that all the pieces are there. If I only have that much, I can only can at five pounds pressure, which really is of no value in Oklahoma. Uh, depending on where you live, 10 pounds pressure could do it, or if you live out in a higher elevation, you may need all three. So it's best. If if you have all three components so that you can use it to the maximum. So these are just some of the things that you want to look for. Make sure that everything's there, everything's in working condition, um, and then don't pay too much. You're at a garage sale. For Oklahoma Gardening, this is Barbara Brown. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, Casey will bury some spring blooms. We'll travel to a unique garden oasis in the middle of a food desert in Oklahoma City. We'll get some of the highlights of the squash row cover trial, and we'll get the buzz on our native bumbles. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.